please help me in welcoming Senator Bernie Sanders to the podium. Thank you, Carolyn, very much for that generous introduction. And uh, let me thank all of you for being here, and let me thank your officials uh, for putting this together in just a, a few days' notice. Uh, mostly, I want to hear from you. Uh, and I, we don't have a whole lot of time, so I don't want you to be shy, ask any question that's on your mind, or any comment that you'd like to make. Uh, but let me say a few words uh, as we begin. We'll start off with the bad news, then the good news, and then we'll open it up. I think uh, in politics and in government, it's important to be honest with people, to tell people where we are as a nation, as a state, or whatever. And the truth is, and I don't think I have to tell you this, I think you already know this, this country has a whole lot of problems. And the goal, of course, is working together throughout this country that we're going to address those problems, and I think we can, but it's important to lay the problems right down on the table. Uh, maybe at the top of my list, and this is certainly not a Vermont or an American issue, it's a global issue, is the crisis of global warming. And I know that you all have thought about it, and I expect that many of you are studying it. And what the scientists, the people who have studied this issue the most are telling us is that we do not get our act together, and that's just not America. That's China, that's Russia, that's the entire world. If we do not stop emitting the huge amounts of carbon that we are emitting into the atmosphere right now, the planet that you will be raising your kids in will be a planet that will be increasingly uninhabitable uh, and unlivable. So at the top of my list is transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. And the good news is I think we're raising consciousness on this and we're making some progress. Well, we recently made uh, the largest investment uh, in world history, I think, in terms of uh, solar and wind and energy efficiency, but we have an enormous amount of work uh, to be done uh, in that area. Uh, other areas that concern me, are the areas of education, and we we'll want to talk about that as well. Uh, it's important that you guys, for a dozen different reasons, all the reasons that you know, get the best quality education you can, regardless of the income of your families. And when I talk about education, that means from child care through graduate school. And clearly one of the issues that I will be tackling uh, as the chairman of a relevant committee is how we can create a situation where all the kids in this country who have the desire and the ability to get a higher education are able to do that. And right now, one of the problems that we have and we're working on it uh, is many young people are leaving school deeply, deeply in debt. So people leaving college, 30, 40, $50,000 in debt. If you want to go to medical school, the average debt is $250,000. Talk, uh, talk to dentists to leave dental school three, four hundred thousand dollars in debt. That is not acceptable. So one of the issues we have to deal about is how we create a system in which all people, regardless of their income, can get the best quality education that they need uh, and not leave school uh, deeply in debt. Another issue that we're working very hard on is health care. We are the only major country on earth, many of you don't know this, but the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a human right. And the result of that is that health care in this country, for a lot of reasons, primarily the greed of the insurance industry, health care in this country is very, very expensive. As a nation, we are spending $13,000 for every man, woman, and child. Family of four, $52,000 just on health care. It's a huge expenditure. In fact, it's unsustainable. So the challenge there is to have the debate, and I don't want you to be thinking about it, we'll talk about it in a minute. Is health care a human right? Should it be available to all people regardless of their income? 
And should people have the same right to get health care as you do walking into the school? No one asks you how much money your family makes when you walk into the school. No one cares whether you have a lot of money. You don't have any money. You get the best education this system can offer you, regardless of your income. Many countries treat health care in that respect. We don't. So the issue of health care is an issue that concerns me. Another issue that we have to deal with that is a real problem in this country is some 16% of American workers are living paycheck to paycheck. And that means you go out, you do your work, you work 40 or 50 hours a week, at the end of the week, you, haven't, you don't have any money that you can put into the bank. You gotta go out and pay your bills, your housing, your insurance, your childcare bills, or food bills, you don't have any money saved. Meanwhile, we have more income and wealth inequality today than we have ever had in the history of this country. Now, you don't see a whole lot of that on TV or in the newspapers, and there are reasons for that, but you got three people in America, three people who own more wealth than the bottom half of American society. Three people own more wealth than the bottom 160 million Americans. You have more and more concentration of ownership, where a handful of large corporations control you know, everything that you interact with. How do we deal with uh, that issue? We have a political system today which is significantly corrupt in the sense that big money can buy elections. So for you and your parents, your parents go out and they, their political activity is to vote. They vote for the candidates they like, and that's great. We all have increased voter turnout. But if you are a billionaire, you can spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in every state in this country on 30 second television ads, making sure that the candidate you want gets elected. Is that democracy? I don't think so. So how we create a political system which ordinary people can get the people they want elected rather than billionaires is another issue uh, that we are dealing with. So those are just some of the issues that concern me. That's the bad news. Let me tell you about the good news. The good news is that for a wide variety of reasons, some good reasons, some not so good, all of you in this room have enormous opportunity, economic opportunity, as you look at the uh, future of your careers and what you want to do. As a nation, we need more doctors, we need more nurses, we need more dentists, we need more mental health professionals, we need more teachers. We need more postal workers. You name the job that's out there, we need workers, we need you. And I'll give you an example of how serious the problem is. I'm on a committee uh, in uh, Washington, in the Senate, called uh, Energy and Pub Public Works and Energy. And in that committee, we were able to, working with other senators, bring over two billion dollars into the state of Vermont to improve our infrastructure. You know what infrastructure is? Infrastructure and roads, bridges, water systems, wastewater plants, broadband. Two billion dollars into the state. And if you talk to people in Montpelier, what they will tell you is we don't have the workers today to do the work that needs to be done. We need to rebuild our transportation system in many respects. We need to improve broadband. We need to get solar panels up on rooftops. We need to build wind, wind turbines. And we don't have the workers in this state right now in order to do that. So when we talk about higher education, some of you, I suspect many of you are looking forward to going to college. That's great. We want you to go to college. We want you to get the best education you can. Some of you are good with your hands. And you don't want to go to a, a four-year college. You want to go to a, 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 a school where you can learn to be an electrician or a plumber or a carpenter. We desperately need those skills. And in fact, the wages out there for those jobs are extremely good right now, extremely good. So there are enormous opportunities, and I'd like to talk to you about it and get a sense of where you're coming from, the kind of work you guys are interested in doing, but enormous opportunities out there for you all. All right, last point that I want to make, I want to open it up on, on uh, this, uh, maybe uh, this point. These are, from a mental health perspective, 
very, very difficult times for our country, and I think countries all over the world. I mean, the truth is that in the United States, we've long had serious problems with, with mental health. Uh, we don't have the number of psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors that we need. That's been longstanding. COVID has made it worse, much worse. And it has had a very significant impact on people your age. Your lives have been radically disrupted. I mean, I walk around with a mask, you know, as soon as I leave here, I'm going to put this mask on. I don't want to get COVID. All of you have had to deal with that. You had to deal with the isolation, not going to school, not socializing, not playing ball, doing theater, doing the things that you would love to do, being with your friends for free, not being with your grandparents. It has had a very significant impact on all of our lives. Nobody in this state, nobody in this country has escaped that. And the death toll is high. We've lost over a million people. Tens of millions of people have made it. And the psychological impact of that is significant. So the point that I want to make, and I hope we can discuss it, is if you are struggling right now, or somebody in your family is struggling, do not think you are the only person who is struggling. Millions of people in this country are struggling. And one of the manifestations of that, I would hope we can discuss this as well, and it worries me very much when I'm on this committee that's gonna deal with these issues. We lost last year over 100,000 people to drug overdoses. And we used to think that years ago, well, this was a problem for New Jersey, it was a problem for New York, not a problem for Vermont. We don't have to worry about that. Wrong. We do have to worry about it. It's impacting our state as much, I don't know as much, but it's in, impacting our state in a very significant way. Addiction, terribly serious problem. People are turning to drugs in a way that is rather frightening. I was around the state last month and we went to schools, I went to police departments, Everybody's, every place you go, people are talking about mental health problems. Because when people feel desperate, when they feel lonely, when they don't have any hope, drugs becomes an alternative. You get a short hide. But I want all of you to know, I don't hear the lecture, you know this stuff already, that things like heroin will end you up in two places, either in jail or dead. And with fentanyl being uh, put into the heroin, I mean, it is an awful, awful situation. So I'm going to give you a lecture. You know this. Your parents, your teachers have already said that about drugs and all that stuff. But people are turning to those things because of isolation. And the way out of it is at least to talk to your friends. And I know it's hard. But the point is you are not the only person who is struggling. Your friends are struggling too. And to the degree that we can break through those barriers and talk to each other, we got a shot at not doing crazy things that can ruin our lives. All right. Um, that's my speech, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, let's open it up for uh, questions and comments on any issue. All right, I see somebody right there. Uh, we have a mic running around? Yeah, we got two, Senator, one on either aisle. <clears throat> Just be loud. Give me a name if you could. Um, my name's Gio, and while this may not be political, I've been really curious about this. Do you still have your mittens? <laughs> I do. Well, my wife hasn't told me where they are. She doesn't allow me to gain access to them, but you know that they were developed right here in uh, Essex. Did you expect them to blow up? Huh. Uh, look, I have been in uh, politics for a long time and talking to television cameras is not something that I am unfamiliar with. But I'll tell you what happened. Um, after President Biden's inauguration, I walked back to my office and, and my press guy said, Senator, something is going on. There's a going on out there. And then it exploded. My God. Uh, yes, I was shocked by the kind of attention that it got. Uh, yeah, right here, stand up. Yes, right here. Do you think it's possible for the American government um, to deal with companies like Nestle and their um, enslavement of African people in the Western well, That's an issue some of us have worked on for a long time. 
uh, sometimes in the production of it's not just Nestle. Um, we enjoy products sometimes, uh, and we don't know where those products came from. Uh, and in fact, I was in Ghana many, many years ago, and we had made some progress. It was children producing the chocolate uh, that we eat. So I think there is a growing consciousness about understanding how the product, whether it's a pair of sneakers that you're wearing or the food that you're eating, where is that product manufactured? Who is doing the work? What kind of environmental impact might be happening uh, as a result of us consuming uh, those products? Uh, so uh, the answer is I think we are making some progress on that, uh, but we certainly have a long way to go. Uh, okay, uh, I see a hand, young lady right here. Um, I'm Samantha, and I was wondering what the process for transitioning from our capitalist society to a more socialist structure in terms of healthcare and university, Good. like what's that process and how are you working on it? Good. Um, well, I got a book that's coming out in a month. <laughs> Excuse me. I'll, we'll get a copy of it to your library and send it to every school instead. Look, here is the issue, and I know when you use words like capitalism and socialism, people get very nervous. But what I want to tell you about, and we deal with this a little bit in the book, it's important for all of you, and, and with the internet, you have the opportunity. And I was just talking to some of your teachers, and I gather you're already doing it virtually. You're communicating with kids around the world. Countries, every country in the world does things differently. And it's important for us to learn from other countries. There are some things that we do better than other countries. There are other things that other countries do better than us. For example, just for example, uh, some of you will have family and friends in Canada. In Canada, if you uh, developed a serious illness and you needed a major operation and you're in a hospital in Canada, Montreal, uh, for three weeks or a month, and you had all kinds of sophisticated drugs being used to treat you, what is your bill when you leave the hospital? Anyone know? Zero. 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 Because in Canada, they believe that healthcare is a human right. They don't, by and large, with some exceptions. It is a publicly run system like Medicare is in this country. Uh, and they end up providing quality care to all of their people at about half the cost that we spend. So I am maybe the lead advocate in the US Congress for a Medicare for all. And basically what it does, it gets rid of insurance companies because insurance companies function, what's the function of an insurance company? Make money. To make money. So they are the middle guys, their job is to make as much money as they can by making sure you get less health care. Uh, they pay their executives, you know, millions of dollars every single year. So it's a system that is absolutely dysfunctional. Despite spending twice as much per person on health care, we've got 85 million Americans who are uninsured or underinsured. So this is an issue that I am believe passionately in. I believe that health care is a human right. I want everybody in this room and your parents and your grandparents to be able to go to the doctor that they want to go to and not have to take out their credit card or their wallet. It's a right. And we can do that by saving huge amounts of money by getting rid of private insurance companies whose only function is to make as much money as they possibly can. Okay, uh, I see a question right here in the middle. <clears throat> can we get a mic? Oh, he's looking at his phone. This is going to be a hard question. <laughs> so obviously, our country has experienced um, high inflation recently. Yeah. Um, do you think that even in um, the situation of high inflation that we've experienced, um, social security benefits should be increased? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Excellent question. Uh, we are experiencing high inflation rates. Uh, is inflation strictly an American issue? Only particular to our country. No, it's worse in many other countries around the world. Uh, generally speaking, the causes of inflation are COVID and the breakdown of supply chains. So the companies are not able to get the products, the 
components that they need to make the products that they sell. Uh, the war in Ukraine, Russia's terrible invasion of Ukraine, has hyped up uh, energy prices. And the other part of it, which I talk about a lot, doesn't get all that much discussion, is what I would call corporate greed. So if you look at the price of gas, which has gone down, but if you look at gas prices, and these companies are owned by large ex companies like ExxonMobil and, and Shell and others, you'll find that in recent months, recent years, their profits are record-breaking. So they have used the pandemic and all of the confusion to jack up prices. And it's not only in energy, it is in food uh, and in other areas as well. And uh, it's in prescription drugs as well. So we have to crack down on corporate greed. But in terms of social security, uh, I do believe that we have many, many elderly people in this country who are having a hard time making on fifteen or $16,000 a year. And I do believe we should increase funding for Social Security. The way you do that is by lifting the cap. Right now, people who make a million dollars contribute the same into Social Security as somebody who makes 140000 That's wrong. Lift that cap, more money can come in, we can expand benefits, and make life a little bit easier for many seniors. OK, I see a hand way in the back there. Hi, uh, I'm Mason. Uh, why do you think we're having a hard time finding people to work? That's a good question, Mason. Uh, uh, a few reasons, I think. Um, number one, in this state, at least, as I understand it, and somebody can jump in and correct me if they have better facts, I think uh, the number of young people your age who are in high school right now in Vermont is substantially less than what it was 40 or 50 years ago. Okay? So what you are seeing is birth rates are going down. Uh, in, in you know prior generations, it was not uncommon uh, for families to have five or six kids. Today that is very, very unusual. So we have less people, fewer people entering the workforce. And that's certainly true in this state. Uh, second of all, uh, COVID has had a real impact on the way people uh, choose to go to work. Um, and uh, in addition to all of that, uh, we have a child care crisis so that many people, especially women, who would like to go to work are unable to leave their kids, their little kids, because they can't find affordable child care slots. So child care costs you fifteen dollars or $20,000 a year per child. And you make it 40,000 or 50,000 working, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So those are some of the reasons. But bottom line is, we do have a major, major uh, shortage of workers in Vermont and in many other parts of this country. That's the bad news. But the good news for you is that means there are enormous opportunities for you out there. You name the job, you can get it. Yes. You don't think it has anything to do with the fact that people were rewarded for not working? No, I don't. I think that's a myth. I know it's a political statement. Uh, you know, we gave, uh, I won't go into the whole thing. No, I don't believe, I don't believe that people are being rewarded for not working. I, I think there are a lot of reasons why we have late church. Uh, yep, right there. Yes, stand up. So, uh, for my mom has worked day and night, and she has her job. She hasn't been treated the best at her job. Like she has to take shifts for people constantly, and nobody can help her. And the and like people can just be jerks to her. And I want to know. Are you planning to do something like that allows people that are working or in workspaces to have honestly better lives in it? If so, how? That's, a, that's an excellent question, and obviously the answer is there's no easy answer. You have some workplaces where people are treated with respect. Uh, indignity, their concerns are heard. You have other places where people are treated like garbage. There's no question about it. 
In fact, you have some employers who have a business model that says, look, we're going to pay low wages, we're going to treat people like garbage, and if they quit, that's great, because we'll hire other people the next day. Uh, we don't have to give out any benefits because people are turning over all the time. One of the ways, there's no magical answer to that question. Obviously, we want all workers to be treated with respect. One of the areas that I'm working very, very hard on, and we're seeing some success, is the growth of unions. Anybody here know what a union is? All right. Somebody tell me what a union is and why, uh, why unions are important. Let me get some hands here. Yeah, I see a hand right there. Yeah. Why is the union important? Hold the thing up to your mind. Yeah. Uh, a union is just a group of workers coming together, and that just gives them more leverage. Exactly. Better, That's right. Better you got it. So what it is, what a union does, is if you don't have a union, you're working in a large company, the company can do anything it wants to you. You have no recourse. If you have a union, you have a contract that says, I'm going to work 40 hours. I'm going to be paid certain things. I'm going to get certain benefits. These are all the working conditions. It is a legal contract, and a company can't violate it. We are seeing a growth in unions all over this country. Uh, and as chairman of the committee that deals with that issue, I'm going to do my best to make it as easy as possible for workers to join unions. That's a source of protection. It helps to address uh, the concern that you raise. All right, let me do this. I want, I want to answer all the questions, but I want to throw back a question to you. And as I want to get back to this issue of mental health, I want to get to the issue of drugs. Raise your hand if you know anybody who does drugs above and beyond marijuana. Okay. Raise your hand if you know anybody who is struggling with addiction issues. Wow. All right, I want to. All right. Um, all right, my question is why is that? Why are so many people, young people in particular, uh, struggling or not struggling, doing drugs, dealing with addiction? I see a hand way in the back there. Yeah. James. yeah. Stand up, stand up. Uh, I understand. Um, so, a lot of the time, what I notice is that um, a lot of the problems are being solved with prescription drugs. And, like, that's, that just seems wrong to me. Like, how, how are we, and that, you know, that's going into the economy thing too, like, these big companies that are selling these drugs that are just fixing, trying to fix things, but they don't actually work. And that leads to more, more just addiction tendencies too. Very good point. That's part of the problem. Let me just spend a minute on that. Um, there is or was a company called Purdue. Did you ever hear of Purdue? Purdue manufactured a opiate product which was advertised as a painkiller. So if you had a bad shoulder, you take it and ease your pain. What they forgot to tell you is that if you took it enough, you become addicted to it. And this particular company, which is about as ugly as it gets in terms of corporate greed, they suddenly noticed that there were communities in America where they were selling all kinds of drugs way beyond the population. And they really did know what they were doing is feeding the drug habits of people. They knew it. And you know what they did? They hired more salesmen to sell more of their drugs to get more people addicted. In other words, they were doing nothing that a heroin dealer doesn't do. A heroin dealer will give you free heroin to get you addicted, and then he charges you later on. All right, that's the extreme case. But in general, I think there is an understanding that doctors have been prescribing too many painkillers, and in Vermont and around the country, we're cutting back uh, on the people need relief from pain. That's the problem. And some of these drugs work very well but I think it has been overdone. But that's only one part of the problem. It's a real part of it. I want other hands, what else? Yep, see him right here. Yep, stand up. So my name is actually Chase Garage. My question for you is that 
what would you recommend for people to take time of action, and what could we do? Well, the question that I was interested in right now, you're talking about climate, very, very important issue. If you could hold off on that one, I'll get back to that in a minute. I wanted to stay on mental health, and I wanted to stay on drugs. Uh, and I know sometimes it's hard to talk about it, uh, but I wanted to stay on that. All right. Yes. Green hair. Okay. <laughs> Hold the mic close to your mouth. Sorry. Um, I know many of my peers, um, myself included, have friends or even ourselves have issues with faith in particular. And I was wondering if you, if that's on your mind in terms of yeah. So yes. All right, let's talk. I know it's a huge issue. Okay, let's talk about vaping. How many people here know folks who vape? Whoa! <laughs> See, this is why it's very good for me to do these meetings. It's in Washington, I sit around in committee meetings with people who know nothing about the real world. This is the real world. All right. Tell me why you're vaping. Let's hear it. All right. Stand up. Get a mic. Hi, my name is Lucia Clark. Um, one of the reasons, at least, when I was in middle school that people would tell me was that they would get their friends, older friends' credit cards and they would buy them online um, because online there's not as a restrictive of a policy for buying it because they don't ask you for age right. verification and if they do, then it's as easy as just clicking the bot and checking as if you're a robot. All right, but um, you're still not answering my question. And why? why? And why is because um, people find it easy because when some people can't, at least for my community when I was in Burlington, um, people couldn't get the drugs. So vaping was as as nice as drugs when they couldn't get them. Okay, we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's stay on vaping. I want honesty here. All right. Raise your hand, tell me why you're vaping. What does it do for you? Right, everybody raise their hand that they know somebody. So I guess one or two of you are vaping. Yeah, so I'm going to hand you. Okay. Stand up, please. Um, my name is Lily, and I've heard that it's also like a coping mechanism. Like, I know someone who does it because they think that it helps with stress and it helps, like, a bunch of things that it doesn't actually help with. They were just told it does. Okay. All right. You raised a very important issue. Now we're getting, I mean, the issue of doctor's prescriptions is very important. This is more important. All right. We are living in difficult times. Everybody in this room deals with stress. I deal with stress. My family deals with stress. Everybody is under stress, and COVID has made it worse. All right. Is vaping the solution to dealing with stress. No. All right. All right. I want to have, I want more discussion about people who know people or themselves and me and tell me why. I see a hand in the back. No, stand up. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Yes. Okay, I saw another hand. All right, I see a hand over there. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes I have heard that people turn to drugs, especially vapes, to um, kind of avoid their problems rather than, uh, rather than address them directly. Okay. Look, I don't know how to say what I want to say without sounding like somebody who's lecturing you and, and telling you what you've heard before. People are living with stress. People are living in pain. The truth of the matter is that all drugs will do at best is give you temporary relief and long term make the situation worse. Okay? They don't work. 
And some of these serious drugs will have the impact of getting you in jail or killing you. This fentanyl thing. You all aware of fentanyl? Yeah. Yes. And many of the drugs are now laced with fentanyl, which is far more dangerous than normal heroin. So the issue here, and I thank you very much for raising it, if you are dealing with stress, if you are dealing with isolation, all right, if you got family problems, everybody has a family problem, how do you deal with it other than dealing with drugs? All right, how do you deal with it other than vaping? Who has thoughts on it? Let me get some new hands. Yeah, right there. Yeah. How I deal with my stress and anxiety is I knit or use other coping mechanisms like that or art and reaching out to my family and friends. And Good. Yeah. Good. Reaching out. All right. Do we reach out enough? Do you talk to your friends rather than sitting around? I don't get it. I don't want to be in a lecturing mode here. But do you guys, is it comfortable to sit around and be honest about family problems with your friends? Yes or no? Yeah. Uh, somebody tell me why not. Raise your hand, tell me why not. I see your hand way back. Katie right behind you, they're way in the back. Sometimes friends grow up in different situations and they don't always understand and it can be very hard for other people to understand problems that are happening in your family that they can ever even almost dream of. Good. But is that not a reason to at least, look, if people are dealing with problems and if drugs are just a temporary solution or non solution to that problem, communicate with other people seems to me to be a better direction. Am I right? Am I wrong? Why? What's your experience? Well, tell me about it. If we don't want young people to get addicted to drugs, which we certainly don't, what's the alternative? How do we address it? And by the way, this is not just a local problem. This is a national problem. It is a huge problem. How do we deal with it? Do things like, let me give you another example. I was talking to some of your teachers earlier. If you're out doing theater, if you're playing ball, is that an antidote you're relating to your friends in chorus or whatever it may be? Is that an antidote to loneliness and isolation? Yes. yes. Do you have the kind of programs here that allow you to do that? Yes. All right, talk to me more. Get back to vaping. Yeah, but no, I'm only four hands. I'm attracted to the green hair, but nonetheless. All right. More comments on why people are vaping. I've got a hand right here. There's a strong social element to vaping and heroin as well. Say that again. There's a strong social element. A strong social element. What that means if she's vaping and you're vaping and you're vaping, I can join you in vaping together? Is that what you mean by that? Peer pressure? All right, what about that? Because somebody does something that is not good, or a group of people do it, do you feel pressure to have to do the same? Well, how many of you do? All right, it's natural. Everybody, all your friends are doing something. Why aren't you doing it? Right? All right is that an issue with drugs? Yes. That you get lured into it because other people are doing it? All right, who wants to talk about that? I see a hand right there. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, thank you. My name is Jordan. Uh, the reason. Jordan, hold it a little bit closer. Uh, like, honestly. Okay, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Peer pressure. Peer pressure, yes. So, one of my friends offered me a vape on the bus, right? And they said it would just make everything go away. Well, in all reality, it didn't. It just kind of masked it for like 10 seconds, and then it's another hit, another hit, another right. hit. So. All right, that's it. I think Jordan said it well. All right. All right, let me ask you this. 
And this, look, guys, this is tough stuff. I don't have the answer to it. You don't have the answer to it. Nobody has really the answer to it. This is tough stuff. We're living in difficult times. Everybody, your parents, me, you, my family, everybody is dealing with stress. All right? Why are we dealing with stress? What are some of the stress factors that are out there? Let's talk about that for a moment. Yep. Issues are being solved. Stand up. Sit down. Here's a mic. Issues that uh, should be getting solved aren't being solved. What issues? Uh, anything uh, going from either inflation or personal issues, or just anything in the world to constantly be. Do you feel a little bit overwhelmed by the issues? Of society? Uh, personal. Personal ones, yeah. Um, but ones I can't control, I don't like to stress over those. Okay, good. Thanks. All right. Oh, the, uh, let me get to voices I haven't heard yet. Yes, please stand up. Right here. Yep. I, you know, personally, like my entire life, people have been telling me that like, our generation that's supposed to like, fix the climate and like, society. And although like it is a problem we do need to take steps, it's very stressful and to like think that you are the one who has to like fix the world. Like it, it's always been a thing for us. Excellent point. Are, is, are things like climate change something that worry you guys? Yes! All right. All right. You know, I started off my remarks by talking about something. Because it's real. You know, maybe I can tell you, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. I could be lying to you. It is a problem. But you should not feel that A, you caused the problem, or B, that somehow, for some reason, you're the only people in the world who are obliged to try to solve it. All right? You should be blaming my generation for allowing this to happen. Most of you should be blaming the crooks in the fossil fuel industry for allowing it to happen. All right? So, but right, let's talk about stress some more. I want to get some more hands. Yep, I see a hand right over there. I want to get the people who haven't made a first comment. Hi. Um, a couple of things that kind of just like get me stressed out is like homework or like mastering chemistry assignments that aren't done. <laughs> um, just like school in general or like Good. coming up sport things and just trying to get somewhere on time. Okay. Good. I mean, the dilemma here, and again, no one has a magic link. Your parents, your teachers want you to get the best education that you can to go out and make a difference in the world. But you know, we all have to work on a way to make it not terribly stressful. Let me get to other hands. What are the stresses that are out there? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. So, um, a lot of the things that were really on me are all the bad news about how our future seems really bleak. And you have to juggle that with personal stresses. Like, I have to worry about both the fact that there are countries out there that are sinking, and also I have to turn in my homework assignment for tomorrow. Um, it's hard to be like hopeful for what comes next, and everything just looks really bad with the economy and the climate. Thank you. All right, so you got a combination of worrying about countries going underwater and getting your homework in on time. Right, and that's not a joke, that's real. You know, you got your day-to-day -day things that you have to do, right? And you're looking at a, a, a world. Um, let me just say something before you get too depressed about the future. Uh, I've had the opportunity to go to every state in the country, right? and I've met with you know, large groups, small groups, probably millions of people. And what I want to tell you is there are, especially of your generation, there are great people out there. There are wonderful, your generation, I think, is the most beautiful generation and smartest generation in the history of this country. You know that? That's true. And I have seen among young people all over this country just an incredible amount of decency. Your generation is the most anti-racist, the most anti-sexist, the most anti-homophobic, the most anti-xenophobic, the most compassionate generation we've ever had. So be proud of this.
And there are wonderful young people all over the world who are dealing exactly with the same issues as you are dealing with. All right? And they are tough issues. Believe me, they're tough. But that does not mean that they are in solid. Let me give you one example, and I often talk about it. In 1941, what happened in 1941 in America? Anyone know? Right. You all know what Pearl Harbor was? Okay. Pearl Harbor was attacked by Japan on December 7, 1941. Why do I mention that? At that particular moment, the United States of America was totally unprepared to fight a war in the East against Japan and a war in the West against Hitler in Germany. We didn't have the armed forces, we didn't have the training, we didn't have the equipment, the tanks, the guns, the planes that we needed. You know what? In essentially two and a half years, we won the war. Okay? We turned what people thought was impossible into a victory. Point that I'm trying to make is that sometimes things look bad but change can happen and does happen pretty quickly. All right, it can happen. Can we solve the climate change issue? It's gonna be tough. Yeah, we can. To do it, we're gonna need the cooperation of all of the countries on Earth. China is the major emitter. We have to work with China. They are concerned about the issue. There are cities in China which will be underwater unless we deal with the issue. They know it. They're not dummies, they're smart. Got to deal with Russia, got to deal with Europe, got to deal with Latin America, deal with countries around the world. Progress is being made. We have a long way to go, but I don't want you to feel that the situation is, you know, uh, unsolvable. It is not. It can be solved. All right. Uh, yeah, right there. Yes. Hi. Um, sorry. Um, so I was a senior in high school right now, and when you talk about sources of stress, um, I think it's hard to go like a day or two without talking about problems and who's gotten in here, who's done here. And like, when you go throughout the holidays and stuff, it's like the first thing, like someone will be like, oh, you're a senior? Do you know what your plans are for next year and stuff? Um, and with the college admissions process right now, where stuff is so selective, um, and kids are applying to like over a dozen colleges because they're trying to get into a school that has like a name that could so, uh, get, help them get jobs and stuff. And it just is like this big right. snowballing thing. Right. And I think college stress is a huge thing. Good, it is. Absolutely. Um, and it's expensive too, I think, right? Applying for a dozen schools. Well, how much does it cost to apply to a school? How much? 50 are So 50 times 12 is 600 bucks. It's expensive. Is that is her point? People worried about college. What college are you going to get in? What about the affordability of college? Is that an issue? Yes. Uh, who wants to tell me about that? Raise your hand on that one. All right. Where do I see you? I see right over there. Yep. Right here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Aloha. Um, stand up, Aloha. Stand up. Sorry. Uh, my question is, what is your plan to retain young Vermonters by making college and housing affordable? <laughs> okay. This is my view. Thank you. Uh, so I was asking you the question and you asked me the question. You're a good politician. All right. All right. This is what I think. And I've kind of been a leader on this in the country. A hundred or so years ago, you think kids your age in Essex were sitting in high school. No, they weren't. What were they doing? They were working on farms, maybe in factories, whatever. And what happened is 100 plus years ago, Wisconsin and elsewhere, working class people said, you know what? It's not right that our kids can't get an education when children of the wealthy are able to go to these fancy private schools. And out of that came the concept of public education. And you are sitting right now in a very good public school. What does that mean? It means that when you walk in the door today, you take it for granted. Anybody say, oh, that's 50 bucks. Oh, you're taking biology? That's another 25 bucks. You walk in the door, you don't pay anything out of your own pocket. Is school free? Are your teachers 
not getting a salary, does that cost money to pay the electric bill? Of course it does. It's funded publicly, in this case by local property taxes, by state revenue, and by federal revenue. But 120 years ago, people said it was important for kids to be able to get an education, to get a fair shot at life. Now, over all of that period, it has not really changed. What we say today, kids get K through 12, maybe pre-K through 12. The world has changed. Technology has changed. Jobs have changed. Truth is, you need more education and training to do the work of today than people 50 years ago need. And that is why it is my view, not a radical idea, it exists in countries around the world, that we should expand the concept of public education beyond 12th grade through college, through graduate school. All right? So I believe in free tuition at public colleges and universities. for president talking about that issue. And I'm happy to say that we're beginning to see some part. New Mexico is moving pretty aggressively in that area. There are medical schools now in America where tuition is free. It's going to happen. It's going to happen because the education you need must go beyond 12th grade and some of you don't have the money to pay for the colleges you would like to go to. So that is, that is my strong view. We're gaining on it. Uh, but we have still a long way to go to make that happen. All right, other questions? Senator, we Senator, questions. We, yeah, we got time for about one more question. Okay, I'm going to let you write Hi. Um, I have a question about the intersect, another intersection with mental health. Vermont's highest gun violence rate is suicide by firearm. What is your solution to the intersection between mental health and gun violence? And is there any specific legislation legislation will support to address this. One of the reasons I don't have to, you know, I should have mentioned it earlier when I talk about problems, gun violence in this country is off the charts. And I don't even, I mean, it's one of those issues I don't even like to talk about because it's so painful to be thinking about what goes on in schools, what we have seen with our eyes in terms of what happens to kids uh, with guns. So the answer is not complicated. Uh, we need sensible, gun safety legislation in this country. Uh, there are people who, for the, hit the history of their lives, of violence and criminal activity, should not be owning guns. We need extensive background checks uh, for people who are purchasing uh, a gun. I mean, stuff that most Americans, by and large, agree with. The problem we have is we have what is called a gun lobby. You know what that means? People like the NRA and other gun groups that are very powerful politically uh, to make certain that we don't do what should be done. We're making some progress. We got a long way to go. All right, let me, I've got to get going, but uh, let me just say thank you very much for participating in the discussion.